hydrate before we start. Mm. Yes. So we're going to start. Oh, we're going to go through yeah. this way. Yeah. Oh. All right, here comes the man himself. Woo! Let's do it again. Yeah, we're on, on it again. I'm, I'm liking this. What's going on here? Well, that's what. Oh, that's right. Uh, I must admit that um, we might keep these going even when we come off lockdown because it gives us a good excuse to have a drink after work. It does. Yeah. Anyway, welcome to uh, today's episode. We've decided to do best value uh, wines under $15 chosen by us. Uh, each of us has made a, a decision on uh, what wine we would like to see in the, the lineup. And then as a, as the three of us, we also chose one that all three of us said, yeah, that's, that's worth having. So... I'll tell you who made the choices, and uh, they can start by explaining why they made those choices for the wine, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the wine as well. So, first up, in the white category, we have Yaron Pinot Grigio. This is a pick by Dan, um, and I'll have to ask, all right, Dan, tell us all about it. This is just a very easily approachable white wine. The price, two for 22, it's just a bargain. Really easy drinker, low acidity. Um, I put quite a few of them away myself, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> Last night, even. Uh, yeah, just really approachable, easy drinking style of wine. So, if you're looking at Pinot Grigio, this is a Pinot Grigio from Australia. Uh, Pinot, Grigio, Pinot Grigio is a style classically found in uh, northern Italy. Um, in uh, in the France in France in Alsace uh, you'll find it Pinot Gris same grape different uh, different style of making it but in Australia we sort of fall between the Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio uh, it's a fairly neutral grape generally in Australia it does get a little bit of those sort of forward stone fruits um, uh, but generally it's more uh, an easy drinking quaffable style of wine it's not a not a big complex let's ruminate about wine. So um, we'll just have a quick look. Good golden colour, or I should say, good straw colour. Nose is really stone, stone fruit. Mm. Yeah, it's got that, that stone fruit on the palate weight. That's probably becoming. That's coming. If you're having an Italian Pinot Grigio, you'll you'll get some more light stone fruit characters. This is actually a far more predominant sort of richer character to it. It's got a touch of tropical fruit in there as well. Um, but nothing really, nothing really overt like pineapple or anything sort of like that. Uh, Pat, what's your quick take on this? I know you're not a huge white wine drinker, so yeah. Oh, as as white wine goes, it's just yeah. There's a reason why Dan drinks it. It's yeah, really easy to drink. It's almost too easy to drink. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely just say that one. Yeah, it's actually. I'm sorry. I really should start the way properly. Just see if you haven't seen this before. Uh, we're the three wise men of wine. <laughs> it's actually a joke. Uh, we have uh, to my right here, Pat. He's the uh, novice wine drinker and uh, he's one of our staff that's learning about wine at Purple Palette. Dan, who I've had under me for 10 years and now. And not quite how I like No, uh, that's probably not, <laughs> the way, not, not in this open minded society, yeah. that's fine as well. Uh, he's the knowledgeable one. He's got a very good palate and knows his stuff about wine. And my name's Andrew and I'm the know it all. So, yeah, as I said, Pinot Grigio, uh, lovely, easy drinking style. It's nothing that's going to be too challenging. It's great for a hot afternoon on the deck having a drink. And probably it's it's my sort of white, if I was going to go for a nice, easy drinking white, uh, I'd actually probably go Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio. Um, because Sauvignon Blanc is not one that I particularly enjoy, unless it's like a Sancerre or a Pour, a pour for me. Those, those are really good. Acidic, I find. So yeah, for my the rasping acid of, of mm. Sauvignon well, can be pretty full on. I like a Sauvignon Sauv, but mm -hmm. the, just a straight Sauv, I think, is like, yeah. Actually, Sauvignon's good. Yeah, so it's absolutely. Sort of yeah, yeah. yeah Sauvignon Sauv, I must admit, I, the lime component that goes into it pulls back a little bit of some of those really gooseberry and, and in some cases, from what's true, the passion fruit character, which I find a little bit too much and too overt. Uh, I do like that sort of citrus line sort of cutting through it actually bounces off the fruit a bit um, but still that, that acidity is there quite quite dry and raspy and in fact if you read up all the books for it a rasping acidity is kind of what it's termed as uh, and that's like a really searing grating acidity over the tongue um, that being said i've had a few lower acid wines but they get quite cloying and quite sweet uh, after a while i'm not a big fan of those 
This one here, the acidity, um, though Dan said it is a lower acidity, it's not low by any stretch of imagination, it's still a, a, a medium, medium plus acidity. It doesn't sort of give you heartburn, though. No. Some certain ones will just give me heartburn. Yeah. But it's just a really lovely, easy drinking one. It, as I said, two for 22 or 15 bucks a bottle, I think it is. It's, yeah. it's a great little pickup. Um, there were some other contenders in the range that that I thought we, we would like to look at. One of my ones that I was going to pick was uh, Yarrowwood Chardonnay. But the price point for that, whilst I, we have it at about $15 on special at the moment, it kind of really sits at about the $18, $19 category, so it's a bit sort of hard. Um, the Zilzi Regional range, a lot of that stuff, again, it's on special for about two for 30. It's normal price points, $18.99. Those things are just really good, but we chose ones that are Fifteen dollars and below. So if you are sort of saying, "Oh, but there are better wines or other wines in our store that you prefer because of that," here there's just a couple of caveats that we put on it. Um, but for me, I thought when when we said that wines that we chose, um, I thought Dan's well, Dan's first pick was obvious for us. Yeah. In fact, uh, your motorcycle is sponsored yeah, by Yaren, really, it's isn't it? Put together by Yaren. <laughs> it's had to come apart a few times and get put back together, but. <laughs> How do you do, like, with the electrical... I've seen you sitting there with the electrical diagrams. Mm. Rewiring your bike up. Yeah. It's, How do you uh, do that while drinking? Nah. <laughs> it's challenging. It's a ch <laughs> <laughs> I had to go and buy glasses. I couldn't see the bloody wiring diagram. <laughs> go blind. So, if you were going to have this with food, like, what would you... What seafood. Would you, seafood, yeah. Seafood or uh, chicken. Yeah. Like, a simple chicken, not a... Not a big mushroom creamy, sauce yeah, and cream. Not buttery, just, yeah, not a butter chicken or like that. Um, I have actually put this on to a few people for spicier dishes, but not really spicy dishes. It works really well in, in some of the Indian dishes, mild curries, um, those dry curries, they work really well for that too. Is that just the acid working off it? Or, yeah, yeah, it's basically the acid, yeah. but the fruit, you see, when, when you look at a spicy meal, the spice is not an, it's not upfront spice, it actually yeah. turns up in the mid-to-back palate, which means that your wine will be competing in the mid-to-back palate. So if you're going out to dinner to an Indian restaurant and you take a $200 bottle of Shiraz, the fruit component of it's lovely. You lose everything else because the spice has overridden the rest of your palate. Um, it's just, yeah, unfortunately, it's the spice overrides everything, it takes away all the complexity or the length. Um, unless you've got a wine that really cuts through it, which is few and far between. Um, generally, you want something that's a lot of fruit up front, um, you know, or, or I should say a bit of fruit up front, uh, but then you want just some simple flavours, that's it. You don't want to be trying to compete going head to head with a curry, because a curry will win every time. Um, you know, some, of the, some of the Chinese dishes I've had would go really well with this. Dumplings, quite nice, particularly with those uh, pork dumplings that we've had. Is yeah, Australian good. made Chinese? Yeah, Australian made Chinese. <laughs> yes. Um, right, so now we're going to go to Pat's pick. Now, I'd like to point out, Pat did this pick completely by himself. Uh, as, a, as a novice wine drinker, he, he said, look, I, I, what I think I'd, I'd like is this one. This is the Brock and Shack True Soup. So, no, it had nothing to do with us being owned by Trevor Harsh from Brock and Shack. This was actually something that Pat went this wine that he tried in the bar because he, he works in the bar for us when it is open. Yeah. <laughs> was actually a, a big hit for him and there. Do you know the history behind the name, Pat? No, I don't know. Brock and Jack? Yeah, where did that come from? Okay, so the Brock and Jack name is actually an amalgamation of Trevor Harch's children, uh, grandchildren, sorry. Grandchildren. So, Bronte is the Brock. Uh, so yeah, Bronte, uh, Charlie, um, Mac, and Jack. Jack. That's right. So Brock and Jack. Uh, when it first came onto the market, uh, and we were first looking at, at selling it and how it was going to work, we really sort of didn't like. I actually had to ask the question, Brock and Jack, and I had it was something to do with the building. <laughs> yeah, so did I. It was like, oh, I'm not sure. But yeah, so it's actually, and that's on the front here. You might notice there's. Um, Four jigsaw pieces, that, that represents the, the four grandkids. And in fact, if you are a follower of Rock and Shack or you know the, the family, um, so Darren's son, 
Jack? Oh, I keep getting him confused. It's Mac. It is. No, Mac. it's Mac. Yes, yeah, right, it's Mac. Jack's the other one over there. So, Darren's son, Mac, is actually studying business at uh, university. I believe he'll probably go and become the marketing people for, for Brock and Shack. Jack is actually on the vineyard on the farm now, working. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Bronte's too young to do that, but she goes down to the, the vineyard quite regularly anyway. Uh, so yeah, he, it's a real family concern, and in fact, Trevor's son-in-law, uh, Darren, is the rain rep, and I suppose, what's the, what's the word for it? Distributor? No, you're the distributor, what's the word for it? Marketing. General manager. General manager of Rock and Shack. Um, so yeah, it's a really family concern, it's a big family concern, and it is all about the family for them. So this isn't a massively produced wine, you won't find it out and about in dams. Uh, it is only a very small amount, they've got 40 acres, that's all they really have. Uh, and they produce, I think, total production. First, first production they did was only like four pallets, and I'm like, oh, that was not a great deal of, of juice coming out of that. Now it's 12 pallets, so it's gone up exponentially. <laughs> But they, um, they've done a lot of work in the vineyards. They've put together some really clever viticultural work in there. Uh, and the winemaking has really grown with the, the winery brand as well. Um, it's Bronte, McKenzie, Charlie and Jack. Jack that's right. one. So, Rosé. So, Pat, well, tell us all about what you, why you chose it or what you think of it. Well, I, just, I love everything in the Bronte Shack range, to be fair. Like, I've never had a bad wine. Like the Shiraz is brilliant, the Pinot is brilliant, but I literally just can't believe this wine is only about what fourteen dollars, fifteen dollars a bottle. Yeah, it, to me, it's just it's again really easy drinking. It's brilliant on a on like a hot day. You can also have it at night. I find it complements a lot of foods really well. Um, mm -hmm. It's just an all round for yeah for the value for money. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's great. Um, it's a Shiraz based rosé. Uh, so what they do with their zip line, essentially when the grapes come in on that initial press, uh, it's a Saguenay method I believe, it's where they let the, the grapes press for the first first part, and the juice that comes off it, they actually, it's got that pinky sort of colour, uh, and from there they ferment the wine and bottle it. It's um, unoaked, but it's you know, simple winemaking, but it keeps the purity of the grape, the nice uh, flavours, it's got a bit of Turkish delight to it. Um, I find that rosés are a great all-round wine for light to like white to, to pink meat. Um, I have had it with bigger meats, but I've never really found it work particularly well with that. However, on a great on an afternoon, fantastic, particularly with things like you know cabana or you know, sausage and things like that. I've found it works really well. Hot day is great. And in fact, it's been a real resurgence in rosé, a massive resurgence thing. They, at one point, I think, what was it called? Brosé. If they had a big marketing thing for brosé, and I, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was just a marketing ploy that they put together. And I was like, ah, oh. yeah, I can see this just being a, a typical let's make a viral campaign. Until I was out with some mates of mine who, they all work in the construction industry. And they're all at the bar and they said, oh, what do you want to drink? And I'm like, oh, just, I, I don't really drink, you know. I drink fairly good booze. I said, oh, just, just give us a 4X Gold, just to make it easy. We came back with a 4X Gold and four glasses of rosé. <laughs> and I went, wait a minute. Hang on. Oh, I should have just ordered a Chardonnay. Oh, Chardonnay? That's for girls. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was like, yeah, thanks, guys. That's great. But um, I always find rosé used to be a really good, a good overall drinking wine. Uh, you've got quite a broad spectrum of rosé, though. You get everything from the Portuguese Matus style, which is very, very sweet, to the Cote de Provence really dry. Now, a lot of the Australian palate is pushing itself to the dry side, which is fine. Um, I find that some of the, it gets a real dusty note to it if it goes to that really true Provence. My honest opinion of the Australian consumer market is they say they want that dry style, but they don't really want the bone dry Cote de Provences unless they're used to drinking it, because they can be quite hard to get through. Uh, a lot of them prefer that. It's definitely off dry to dry style. A little bit of residual sugar in it, not, not a huge amount. Like your reason, probably about two grams. Um, and they like to have a flavor component in there, but they do like a crisp acidic finish. Um, and that's, that's where it sort of sits. 
So um, this one here. So Dan, what's your uh, your take on it? Oh, I love the nose. It's mm. real soft. Yeah. That berry off dry, as you say. Yeah. It's not sweet, but it's got that little berry drive to the nose. I find. Mm. Um, Being a Shiraz based rosé, you are going to get those those red berries yeah. to it. Um, and well, but fact, also a little, just a little bit of body, a little yeah. bit more body than I thought it, it would have. So mm -hmm. obviously getting that out of the Shiraz rose. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, easy, refreshing, great on a, an afternoon on the balcony. Mm -hmm. So. So rosé can be also made from just about any red grape, and in fact it is made just about from any red grape, but definitely from from Cabernet uh, red grapes. Um, you know, Grenache is actually a very, very popular one. Uh, Cinso, Carrigan, uh, Shiraz, I've had a Merlot rosé. Uh, and all of them actually bring characters that you'd find in the fully finished dry red wine that they make. You'll see characters setting up with that. Pinot Noir rosé is another big one. Saint Gervais, in fact, uh, Walter Clappus's Headness Saint Gervais is very um, obviously Saint Gervais. It's got that, that sour cherry component to it. It's got that hint of herbal quality in there as well, and it finishes dry. So it, it sort of ticks all the boxes that I expect to see from Saint Gervais. Pinot Noir will have a little bit of strawberry fruit and earthiness into it. Um, Shiraz will have red berries. Cabernet will have darker fruits, and it's usually a lot deeper in color with the rosé. Um, don't get too hung up on color when it comes to rosé, because a big, thick skin red grape will produce more colour naturally. That doesn't mean it's sweeter, it just means it's got more colour to it. Um, you can get a deeper body from it too, especially if it sits on skins for too long. You'll actually pick up, I mean that is, for a rosé, that colour is quite, it's quite pink. Um, and if I have a Cote de Provence, I'll hold that up. That would be a really, like, a blush to it rather than the pink. Now, that is literally different grapes. That's all it is. It is Shiraz in comparison to, say, a Caribbean or a Sinso. Sinso is probably one of the main ones that comes out of the Cote on the skin mm. too, also. Yeah. Time, so Wine making affects it a little bit, but generally what they want to do is press the juice, get the juice, ferment the juice, bottle the juice, done. Once it's made, it's done. Um, very little to no adjustments are needed in rosé, so you won't find any um, grape X or anything like that through a rosé because grape X is, will cause too much colour. Uh, if you're wondering what grape X is, grape X is actually an attitude you can put into wine to increase colour uh, and actually even give it some depth of flavour as well. Um, it's not used very often, it's only used if you've had a bad batch of something generally. Or if you're from a region particularly that doesn't produce big thick skin grapes and you want to have the wine showing as a big rich colour, you can add a bit of a grape X into it. Uh, it's actually produced by uh, a place in Barossa called Tarek. And it's a really clever one for me because there's a lot of, at the end of winemaking there's a lot of skins left over. And in other countries and other places they'll take that skin and or they, they'll make it a pomace and they'll take that and they'll ferment it and make grappa. Uh, in Australia those skins can be used as fertilizers and stuff, but you've only got so much, it's quite acidic, you don't really want to throw it on your your, your lovely soil sometimes, so what you'll do is you'll sell it, and the guys at Tarek will take it, they'll extract all the tartaric acid out of it, so it gives you the acidifying component that you use to acidify wine with, and they'll also take the tannins out of it and create essentially grape X. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's rosé in a nutshell though, is this one here, lovely, um, subtle, but still has some really lovely flavours at the front, and finishes quite dry. So, find a little bit of acid as well when it finishes. Like, mm. yeah, not so much on the front of the tongue, but yeah, about halfway through. Yeah, it's the acidity is there to clean it off and get yeah. Christmas to the back. So, I feel like we're kind of rushing today. We shouldn't really be rushing, otherwise, I have to talk about it. Oh, yeah, da. Pizza. Hmm. So, there's been a bit of a running theme for the last few weeks. Not intentionally, we just it just happens to be that way. Um, Masoni's El Nino Tempranillo. We've already shown the Sangiovese, uh, 
we even had a look at the Shiraz last week. But this one is probably my pick from the range of El Nino. I always loved the Santa Fe's. Always thought it was like the, probably the the biggest winner for me was was actually the Santa Fe's until the Tempranillo came out. Now Tempranillo's only come out last couple of years, hasn't it? Last year two? Last couple of years anyway. Well, no, 2008 was the start. Okay, well we've only seen the Tempranillo in the last couple of years up here. And it was a, a revelation, the fact we can get a good Tempranillo at a price that is so saleable that people can get into a Tempranillo style. So Tempranillo is one of those grapes that historically comes from Spain, particularly uh, around the region of Rioja um, and the Duro River. Anyone win the prize last week? Did someone come back with the, the answer? Not that I saw, no. no not that I saw either. No. I did sell a six pack the next morning, mm. but so I gave away one. Mm. And we know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe if they, they can post on it, they'll get the prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the El Nino, Tempranillo, uh, so let's go back. So, historically Spanish grape uh, from Rioja and the Duro River. Um, Rioja is renowned for its Tempranillo and Grenache, or Grenache. Um, it's been brought over to Australia and is grown generally in the, the South Australia, um, South... Someone done packing Maybe. I'm guessing so. Let's see what I'm up with. Uh, uh, South Australia and Red Victoria. Okay. It's getting worse. Packing or rewrapping? No, I think they're rewrapping. I'd say they must be. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll just put that off to the side then. Um, so, it uh, has always been quite a fruit forward style. Um, bright red fruit. Uh, bright, actually, red and black fruits. When I was over there, depending on the reef that you have it, there's three reefs in Rioja that, that they do. You've got uh, Rioja, Alavesa. Uh, Rialta, Rioja, Alta, and Rioja Baja. I think they've actually renamed Rioja Baja as Rio, Rio, Rioja, oh, sorry. You're just making it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rioja, um, Orient, that was it. They, they gave, they called it Orient. Oh, don't know, they just did. Um, it's an interesting little setup because you've got sort of the Spanish and Basque countries sort of on top of each other. So some parts of Rioja Alta, uh, Rioja Alta are actually in the areas of Rioja Alavesa. Um, Alta and Alavesa are two. One's, one's a, a Basque word, one's actually a Spanish word. And they actually sit, one nests actually above the other. It's actually quite, a, it's, it's a bizarre setup for it. But um, that being said though, uh, brought over to Australia, this has been grown down in Blancara. Um, is it? And Glencara, pretty sure yeah, it is. They've only got Glencara and Mornington Peninsula. This isn't grown at Glencara. Isn't it? Okay, where's it grown? So it's Victorian selection. Mm, probably from a few different places. Yeah, so this is probably bought in fruit in that case, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go with it's, it's from Victoria. Um, so I'm trying to think of the reasons. Uh, Yarra Valley does have a little bit of temp into it, but in it, Valley. Yeah, I'd say King Valley would be a bit more, but more of that's Italian varietals, more than it is Spanish varietals. Um, going across... Uh, no, I'd, I'd, I'd have to say I'm unsure overall where. But, beforehand, the only Tempranillo you could get under 20 bucks was um, Yolamba Wise Tempranillo, which is a great little Tempranillo. But this one here, just with... <coughs> Just seamless forward fruit. It's pretty, it's got a perfumed nose, it's got some powerful structure to it, a sort of powerful fruit and a good structure to it. The acidity balances it off nicely so it's not cloying. Um, I think it's a great little wine and it's a, it's a, you know, the $15 a bottle or two for 25 is stunning value. It is great with pretty much any food you can, you can name. It's got enough body to carry it off with steak. But it's got uh, enough 
finesse and subtle as to carry it off with everything down to you know, pork. Um, yeah. Probably pork is, is a great it's match. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So fantastic for me. Uh, Dan, what's your take on it? Yeah, I think it'd be great with pork. The nose is huge, the colour's really deep. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it'd cut away the, the fat from the pork. Yep. And just go really well with that. Yeah, the tannin structure is lovely. It's not an overt tannin, it's soft, it's round, but it's there. It's it's not gripping it's, like a cabinet. It does get it's a little alcohol in the nose up high. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the sand is, but it's, it's up around 15, but that's what it seems like. You are completely correct. Oh, there you go. Well done. Nice. Told you you were good. Can you smell that because of last night? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's just him smitting his arm back into the No, but he is right. There is a there is that sweet flavour you get from mm. alcohol, the sweet note. Um, it's not overbearing in the, in the taste. It doesn't. Mm, no. Flavour. Uh, yeah, it's not not that warm into yeah, a feeling you get. Yeah, it's not burning a lot or warming. Mm. Oh, I have to say that's, that's a lovely wine. It's probably, um, I said, it's it's one of my favourites. My my take home. My wife sort of says, "Oh, can you bring us a dozen wines um, fairly regularly?" <laughs> <laughs> she does and, have to put up with it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> she, she does need to drink at the end of the day. But um, you know, that's always. I've always got two or three bottles of that in the box with it. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, my I've got champagne tastes on a beer budget myself. So things like this are. Uh, pretty much mm. what I need. Uh, and in fact, uh, a lot of guys that I know that are quite well off and wealthy and that they, they sell, you know, that they have quite a, a good collection of wine themselves, don't want to just, don't, don't want to crack open their $50 and $100 bottles just for an afternoon mm. drink. And this, they, they buy this by the, by the carton, essentially. Um, it's a great wine. How yeah, is Joe? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Joe's not well. Oh, he's not? No, no. no. Um, no, he's, he's a, a bit sick at the moment, so, you know, good best wishes and hopes for Joe. Mm. Uh, you know, hopefully he'll get better soon and we get to get him back here having a drink with us again. Um, I mean, it's a pain in the ass for him and Tony, though, being in lockdown, because they're, you know, Joe's 70... I don't know, he's got a birthday. He's birthday recently. Yeah, he's about 70. Uh, and for him to... And he's a very vibrant man. He just you know, runs from pillar to post. Um, you know, I, I think he'll be okay, but geez, it's um, it's a bit concerning when when you know one of your friends like that goes down. It's, yeah, not yeah. Sure. So uh, as I said, yeah, so good luck, Joe. We're thinking of you, mate. Hmm. But uh, yeah, beautiful fruit. It's actually got complexity. Now this is something that we talk about uh, in premium wines a lot. We don't talk about it a great deal in entry level wines. And there's a reason for that, because when you make wine, why why is this bottle $15 and why is SC Pinnell's Tempranillo 28 What's the difference? Well, <laughs> don't do it. Oh, center of attention. There you go. See, I always knew you, but there you go. That's better. If you're trying to call me right now, it's not a good idea. Yeah. Well, it's soft all calls. I actually put that on there. Um, so what were we, where were we up to? I don't know. We can put off on the phone call. Good idea. Um, um, expensive and cheap. Oh, yeah. yeah so what, what's the, why would you, what's the expense difference between you know, a $15 Tempranillo from El Nino and a $28 from Nessie Pinnell? Well, let's just make the assumption. And let's just, just, just clear it all out. But... It's all, let's say all the names are equally of value. Okay, so once we take the name out of it, it's, they're all equal of value. So the grape growing um, is probably the same. Although especially, although better grape quality, you know, depending on your business model um, and production levels. So therefore the production level is gonna be less on uh, SC Pinnell's, but greater on El Nino's. Um, so therefore that, that whole quantity uh, the quality of quantity, essentially. But when we talk about complexity, uh, it's a big, big part of it, and it's actually the winemaking involves and scrape selection, winemaking, and then the aging process involved in that. So, what makes this one less expensive than his? Well, I reckon it's probably, and this is just a guess, and I can be proved wrong. 
Um, sourced grapes is always cheaper uh, than, than growing grapes yourself because let's face it, growing grapes costs a lot of money. Uh, but sourcing them once they're made, especially if the market is saying we can't sell much mm. to other people, then uh, it's, it's a good thing to buy. Um, wine making for this, the wine making does use older oak in this, uh, which again cuts down costs. Uh, the quality of grapes, I reckon, are probably similar. The uh, winemaking is probably similar, but just the oak is rating is different. But I do find that wines that are made well will show complexity, irrespective of many other things that people talk about. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at any of the $100 bottles that we've got sitting over there, they've had you know, full Malo, they've had, um, you know, uh, the, when they've blended, they've barrel blended to create a style they're looking for. So, therefore, um, say 100,000 litres, they only use 10,000 or 20,000 litres to, to create that wine. So, therefore, it makes a smaller production of wine even smaller again. But the blending is there to create complexity. So you've got different things in your uh, wine, you've got different alcohol levels, different tannin levels, different um, structure and different flavour profiles depending on where it's grown. So a wine like this, which would be a, a bulk bulk juice, um, made well using old oak, I'd say that the grape quality is pretty good and probably quite diverse where it came from. It still gives different flavours. And in the construction of the wine itself, and I don't know if it, if it is just a let's throw everything together and construct it or if it was actually constructed. Uh, at the lower end, generally, uh, a lot of people construct their wines quickly with a view to producing uh, literage rather than it is a quality level. But as long as the quality level is good, they'll, they'll do it. So if you've got a bunch of really good quality grape, you can produce a very large amount of that uh, and you can sell it a bit cheaper. So don't... Don't not look at the uh, complexity of a wine just because it's cheap. Just because the cheaper wine is there, it will... Ooh, you're getting phone calls too. Hello, Vicky Jane. <laughs> Put her on camera. <laughs> oh, I'm in the middle of a tasting. What are you up to? We forgot. <laughs> we forgot what? She forgot. Oh, did she? Yeah. Oh, this is for you, Vicky. Oh, so. We're, we're going to drink this for you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, crazy daughter. <laughs> she, actually um, said, she actually said she missed being on Wednesday afternoons because she's not rostered on because she learns by listening and um, mm. gets to have a taste. There's so. nothing stopping her coming in. Oh, that's what I said. Come sit down the end of the table yeah. and join in. Put it this way, it's happy for me to pour another glass. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, essentially, yeah, don't, don't just buy a cheap wine and look at it and go, oh, well, I only paid... $15 for it, so I don't expect much out of it. You should be getting good wine at $15. Between 12 and 15 bucks is a good litmus for seeing how a winery produces wine. If they make a decent wine between 12 and 15 bucks, then you can be assured the next level up, the next tier up is going to be better again, and so on and so forth, so you get to the super premium range. What you will find for some wineries is that they will make a really good entry level wine, but then their later uh, wines may, should always be should always be better. But if they have made a very poor entry level wine, why would you look at anything above that? Mm. And this is kind of how a lot of people manage to really struggle with um, their brands. They've made they're known for a cheap wine, and then they make a really good wine, but no one wants to buy it. Mm. So if you can make a really good entry level wine then your estate range will look really good uh, and it'll show you a quality of wine. People are prepared to go up to the next mm, level. Yeah. Like, Ooh. Yeah. 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 Ironically... That, that shows just even with the, the El Nino and the, the Masoni. Masoni shows, yeah. Masoni yeah. is much better again. Yeah. And that, that's the thing. It's like, honestly, um, when Masoni actually has uh, an estate sense of to drink, like their, estate, their El Nino sense of is great. Their estate is phenomenally great. Um, 
and I, I don't know if you're above that. Or not. So you know you can happily buy up and buy up with confidence. Uh, this is a problem that, that has been done. I won't name the winery that did this, but they are an iconic winery who have made a brilliant range for a very long time, and they export a heap of stuff to China. Decided to get into the entry level market and made dross. Unfortunately, your average wine drinker doesn't go out and buy a $35 to $40 bottle of wine every day. They will buy $12 to $15 wine every day. And when they drank the $12 to $15 wine, it was terrible. And they thought, why would I bother buying your $30 to $40 wine if you're making this, this bad a thing at this level? Um, and in fact, over time, that winery even removed its name off that entry level range that it, it did. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to tell you who that is. Don't, please don't take a guess on camera because I don't need the legal lawsuit. Thank you very much. But that being said, though, um, you know, it's a good litmus to see where things are. I mean, you know, the other part of it is depends on your marketing budget as well because there is a winery, again, a different one this one, where they have created a good entry level range. It's solid the whole way through, but they make so much of it that they have to cut it, uh, they cut the price to, to sell a lot of it. So of course that means in the eye of the consumer, it's not as good as it was. Um, and then they made another another tier above that. They don't expect to pay this for it now. Yeah, now, right. now that's it. Oh, yeah. You want to pay, I'm not paying that for that. That's ridiculous, yeah. it's always been this price. Um, and then they made a tier above it and that tier above it, they're like, yes, this is a really good we've made, you know, from regional areas, we're not, not overall to Southeast Australia, um, from Barossa or from McLaren, whatever it is. And then they've gone, this is great. And then somehow I think their marketing department went, yeah, we can sell that for $12 a bottle. And they go, but it's every day that the price is 20 bucks, but we're going to drop it to 12 to make people you know, really good, being that their entry level range was... 12 going down to 10. Um, so therefore that range you sort of look at and go, well, if the normal range is, is 12 bucks and that drops to 12 bucks, I'm gonna buy that range instead. Um, and then they thought they'd premiumize themselves by whacking their name on top of an iconic wine brand. And that iconic wine brand had been for decades under one label. Then they literally changed the name and that iconic wine brand sales just went straight through the floor. People actually picked it up, looked at it, went, oh, they've bought that out. They, they actually had owned it all the way through, but they went, oh, they've bought that out, that's terrible, I'm never buying that again. And that was it, it was gone. Um, and reinvigorating that brand has been a real struggle for them. So... Reinvigorate. No, no, <laughs> no, that's... that's no. Not going there? No, okay, I'm not going enough. there today. Um, but yeah, so... Again, this is where some marketing departments in, in regards to wines are always a struggle right? and always doing just stupid things. Um, honestly, this is, this is actually something that we try to do here. Um, we succeed it for the most part, but we would like to protect the brands that we sell. We don't want to smash them out at like, you know, cheap prices so we can sell lots of them. We'd rather protect the brand that because the winemakers made the wine, he sold it to the wholesaler who then sells it to us. Now, if we cut our margins down to ridiculously low and, and we sell a heap of it, the winemaker may or may not suddenly see his wine in the market at a lower price point. He's not going to be too thrilled mm. to see that, especially if you're a big enough chain or a big enough group of guys that you now undersell this great wine that they've been putting their heart and soul into and suddenly, well, you have to ramp up your production to try and make the margins that other people would like to make. So it can be quite a difficult thing. So ethically, um, we've always tried to sort of sell the wines for the price that the winemaker would like to see it and the distributor would like to see it. But we also need to make money ourselves as well. So we always do try to, to balance that off. Now, the last one that we're doing um, is actually uh, God, it's, it's been in shop for years. I've loved it for years. Uh, we put our heads together to find a wine that we all agreed should be on tasting. And it's three brothers reunited. This is from Journey's End Winery. Three, three brothers reunited Shiraz. So 
probably one of our biggest sellers. Yeah, one of our biggest, biggest selling Shiraz and a two for 25. A two for 25 flies. Yeah. I actually didn't like this wine when I first tried it. Yeah. Um, it was a couple of vintages ago from memory, but yep. it actually tasted too aged for me. It tasted a bit old world. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, it wasn't fussed, but I took one home the other night and it was lovely. So, but this vintage is obviously much nicer than, mm. than well, well, a lot better than what I thought the original was. So we'll get Pat's take on it because this is this was our this is our wine that we sold in the bar. It's our house wine. So Pat, hit us. Yeah. Um, People are always shocked when they when they see they think the house wine is like poor quality or like a house Yeah, they think yeah, it's cast yeah. wine. Yeah, but um, yeah, they have that and they're blown away. They, I think we have a lot of referral buyers just from next door who try for the first time and then yeah, yeah, realize it's not. I, I get that people come in and go, oh, yeah. what's that one they've got in the bar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then find out it's two for twenty five and yeah, 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 it's brilliant wine. Then. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, lively, good colour. It's quite a dark colour. Nose is... Black olives and this. Yeah, it's, it's almost, I don't know, I'm getting a little bit, a bit burnt, sort of. Like smokiness? Bit, smokiness, yeah. yeah. That can be from the oak, yeah. the chari oak. Yeah, it's quite smooth. Um, not a lot of tan, like, mm -hmm. I don't think. Well, there's McLaren. tannin, but yeah, it's, it's soft, soft and yeah. easy, soft red. Is it McLaren bark? It is McLaren bark, It's yeah. got that real dubiness about yep. it. But it doesn't actually have McLaren bark written on it, remember? Uh, it did have. Did it was, but it might have... They might be sourcing outside now. Mm. Um, but definitely that dubi McLaren bark. Yeah, wine of Australia, South Australia, produced with milk products, traces may remain. Yeah, okay. Okay, originally... I believe, and I'm going to say I believe because I was working on it, uh, working, trying to work out the, the provenance of it. Originally, uh, it was originally all McLaren Vale fruit. As far as I know, it is still all McLaren Vale fruit. But the fact that he says um, wine, of Australia. Wine, of, wine of South Australia would suggest that maybe he have sourced some Adelaide Hills, um, Shiraz, uh, Fleurolet, um, which is you know, slightly south of McLaren, or even some Langhorn Creek juice to put into it. Um, the winemaker for it, I'm not sure if he wants to be associated with it, but he, I can't see why he wouldn't be, and that's Ben Riggs. Uh, so he's an excellent winemaker from McLaren Vale, really good. I didn't realise that was his. Yeah, it is. Uh, he's a contract winemaker for several people, and this is a label that he was a contract winemaker for, whether he still is or not, I'm unsure, but. It's always been consistently good. Pat's doing the advertising today. Yeah. Oh yes. Well, there you go. I do actually remember hearing that it was Mr. Associated with Mr. Chris, Riggs, yeah. um, a while ago. For me, it's got complexity in that it's got dark fruits, it's got blue fruits, it's got some olive to it, like some olive tapenade. It's got some some anise character in there as well. So therefore, automatically, it's a it's a it's got complexity. It is. Uh, Older oak to it, so there's not a huge amount of vanilla, so there's a little bit of um, nuttiness to it, but not a huge amount. Uh, the fruit is quite developed. It is, it's definitely McLaren Vale, like predominantly McLaren Vale. Uh, the acidity is, is nicely enough to balance it off. I reckon after a couple of bottles, it might get a little bit cloying, mm. but after a couple of bottles, I don't think we'd really notice that much. Um, very good fruit. Night. The alcohol uh, is 14 and a half, so it is. It is you know, higher higher alcohol, but um, I find it it's the it does actually lack some body for me, mm -hmm. but at a yeah you know, I said I'm, and I'm going to use the excuse that at a fifteen dollar wine, uh, it's still got interest, flavour, complexity. It's got character. The persistence in the back is it's a medium persistence, not not incredibly long persistence, but it seems to show. A good Shiraz, like it is just a really good Shiraz. As a red wine, if you got thrown that, you'd just be like, oh, that's that's excellent to drink. As a Shiraz, you'd look at it and go, that's really good. Um, you know, I think it, as a McLaren Vale Shiraz, probably the forward fruit and jamminess would make it a little bit over extracted. 
but I mean, this we're now getting to nitpicky stuff, <laughs> and this is for a fifteen dollar wine at that, that nitpicky sort of stuff. It's, it's getting a bit hard. Twelve fifty if you buy two. Twelve fifty if you buy two. Yeah. yeah. So again, yeah, brilliant little wine to have. Um, and as a an on pour thing for us, I mean, geez, you know, I can't think of a wine that you you'd be selling um, for. What are we? What are we? Six fifty a glass or something? Six fifty a glass. Yeah, six fifty a glass. That's mm. stunningly good value. Yeah, and then its main competitor, which is only a dollar more, is Brockenshack, which is oh, another yeah. unbelievable trust. Yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah. So. But then you can see it. You can see the step up. In I, that I've, I've been to some. I've been to some pubs where if they had a Shiraz like that, that would be their top shelf Shiraz. And yeah. Yeah. They probably sell it for eight fifty a glass and. Yeah, yeah, do another cast wine. Yeah, truth. Yeah, so yeah, truth be told, though, I've been to quite a few restaurants where I've had some really top ends. Oh, not top end, but you know, mid range, twenty five, thirty dollar bottles on pour, and that stands up quite merrily to it. Mm. Um, it's a pretty decent wine. It's pretty good. I mean, you know, wine show category wise, as I said, probably too too over extracted to get anything above ninety points, but it's a great wine. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, not it's as good as Yarra and Pinot Grigio. No, no, Yarra and Pinot Grigio just ticks all those boxes, especially when you're doing a motorcycle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, otherwise, I say, any other any other points to bring home there? Um, well, going back to the El Nino, um, yep. I remember that was kind of my foray into wine, realizing that I, I do think there is a bit of a stigmata in. Um, lower price wines, mm. just in, um, I find a lot of people can look down on them and like, I think it's um, a little bit of an ego match when um, upper, like, well to do people buy wine, they try and spend the most amount of money. Yep. I've got a few friends like that down in Brisbane and I've taken, like, I think that was the first one I took around there, the El Nino Tempanillo, yep. and they were blown away. Mm-hmm. And I just put a bit of dust on it, made it pretend that it was a hundred dollar bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that's the thing. Did they ask you to get you a few bottles? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, and I charged them <laughs> eight bucks a bottle. Yeah, there you go. Good yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that's the thing. It's like um, the reason that people buy wine is it's a myriad of different reasons. It's not just about the actual wine itself, it can be about the status of actually having a bottle that no one knows, mm-hmm. you know the story of, um, or that everybody knows and knows how expensive it is. Which is you know, why some iconic brands are literally playing off that name to produce as much of it as they can, because they know they're going to, they can get the price because of the name behind it. I find it is one of my favourite questions though when you have a customer come in and ask, um, "What is a good wine for under twenty dollars?" Like, yep. yeah, it's like you know, the amount of good wines you can show them for over twenty dollars. Yeah. You can yeah. point and pick whatever. That's twenty. If it's over twenty dollars, you like, guarantee yeah, it. There's heaps. But, yeah, but if. You, if people ask you for a good wine under that price, you actually you, there's still you could, a lot to choose yeah, from. Yeah, there's still a lot to choose from, and they just don't realise. Yeah, my, my, my hard question that I get is, um, you know, they go, oh, I don't know how much to pay for wine. I say, well, what are you looking to buy? Oh, red wine, about 20 bucks. I'm like, well, you've got a plethora now, come on. And we, just, we spent so long. If you're looking to buy great wine, um, 18 to 25 bucks, easy. Any twenty dollar wine should be good, mm-hmm. and in fact, at Purple Palette in this show, <laughs> in this store, we have drunk ninety four percent of all the wines here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's only not some, in one day. Not in the one day, no, no. But we have over time drunk all the wines. We have tried and sampled them all before they come into the store, and we literally choose wines on how much it costs. Do we think it's worth our price, and does it over deliver? If it over delivers, it'll go in the store easily. If it if it's sort of oh yeah, it's, that's a good twenty dollar bottle. How much is it? Oh, it's twenty five. No, yeah, no, maybe we won't get that one. Um, so we will literally pick and choose on that basis. So we try to source wines that over deliver in that price point. And it's um, good that we have different tastes. Yeah, because, yeah mm. my my tastes are completely different to Andrew's tastes. Mm. Except so, I love all wine. Well, I do like, I enjoy all wine, I have an appreciation for it, but obviously I have my favourites and yeah. others, which is great when we go to the, the tastings in Brisbane, the big, the big days where we get to try all the different wines from different suppliers. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and then we'll I'll also say that's how we choose wine. And I'll also listen to our younger staff as well, like Vicky, uh, Cody, Pat. Um, when I say, can you try this? I'll, because some of the wines are not my bag by any stretch of the imagination. I actually really enjoy, obviously, my big, bold reds and really elegant uh, reds. Really like your old world wines. I, love, I do love my old world wines. My, my style. I, I do appreciate why wine is liked and disliked. But if I've got a wine that I'm looking to sell to a particular demographic in the market, and I find one that I think is worthwhile trying, uh, I'll definitely pass that off to the younger staff members who will be able to understand it, or you know, should be able to understand it a bit better, and then they can come to me and say whether they like it or not. And I'll actually take the, that opinion on board because those people that are the demographic we're trying to sell to, particularly from Escartos and, and sweeter style of wines, uh, entry level wine, well, what I like to think of as getting into wine sort of wines, those ones I pass off to the younger girls, guys and girls to, to look at. So I remember 10 years ago when I started, I drank Bundy <laughs> Rum and drank BB. Um, and Crimson Cabernet. And I started on Crimson Cabernet, yeah. 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 Well, it grew out of that quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. Brusco. Yeah. And Brusco, yeah. You, you sort of got forced into it, was like, um, I think, I think the exact conversation I had was, I know you only do about four hours a week for me, but um, I need someone who uh, knows about wine. So you've got two choices. One, you can come with me and we will be drinking every Tuesday um, a plethora of wine that you have to learn about, or I can find somebody else. And you went, oh. I'll take one for the team. I'll take one for the team. <laughs> I think my exact one is I promise to get you drunk every Tuesday, and I think that, that sort of sold it, really. Pretty much happened. Yeah, it yeah. did. And we went through so many wines in that first... It was so good, but... First six months. Yeah. Yeah. And we missed Jess, Jess Egan. Yeah. Well, it's Jess... It's not Jess Egan now, is it? Well, it's yeah, Jeff, it is Jess Egan. It is Jess Egan now, yeah. Mrs. So, Egan to you. Mrs. Egan to yeah. me, yeah. I think it's a good point, though, about the um, uh, entry levels for people starting in wines, because the first time I drank wine, I drank... Eight liters of fruity Lexio, <laughs> and, and went, oh, yeah. I really don't like yeah, that. And, and then a little bit of um, special dry red, and yeah. I was convinced I just didn't like wine. wasn't my thing. Yeah, and I just found out eight eight liters of wine is probably not my thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh look, I, I can't throw too many stones. Are you I, playing Goon of Fortune. Goon of Fortune. Yes. Yeah. I um I started off with Nikov. Oh, oh, that was a nice cruiser bag. Four, yeah, four litres of vodka and anything but orange, it seemed. Because yeah. it was everything in there. It was horrific. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't get it. It actually sold out in all the pubs when I was living down in Brisbane. Couldn't get it, couldn't get it, couldn't get it. And then one day, we all came home. Stephen Colleen, yeah. Harry Duck, buddy. All of us went, we got one! And we had like <laughs> eight casks of this crap that um, nearly killed us. It was not good. One of my best mates at the time in Rocky, a guy called Matt Bell. So him and I went to a party, and uh, we got this four litre nick off. We knocked the whole thing off, and we also I think we had like a little vodka bottle as well. To see us trying to ride home was hysterical. It was like watching some sort of weird skit with us going. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't even bring a bike. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I think that was actually one of the comments we said at the end. It's like, I don't think I didn't I get dropped off. <laughs> We've got a bike now. Okay. But um, yeah, I'd say the, 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 at twenty dollars, a good reg or a good wine should be easy to, to pretty easy to pick up. The difficulty starts coming at the under fifteen dollar mark. At fifteen dollars, you want something that shines. You want something that, that you can take out, not be embarrassed to show and and to drink. Um, and under ten dollars, now you start getting into the really really hard areas. And I mean, under ten bucks. In the world of wine today, with the wet tax on top of it, it is very, very difficult to, to get a wine under 10 bucks. That is going to show anything as good as that. It is literally uh, at 10 bucks retail and up, or 10 bucks, sorry, 10 bucks retail and down, you'll get a good wine, simple, easy drinking, quite pleasant. Um, it may show a little bit of interesting character, but that's about it. It is like an exponential growth from 10 to 15. And then it's like a big jump to 20. And then from 20 to 50 is essentially a good jump. But after that, it begins to sort of, the, the it gets a little bit hard. It's a hard climb. It's a hard yeah. climb. It's, 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 it really is, it's a hard climb. You have to really, really know your palate and your wines to go, yeah. yes. this is why this is a 
hundred dollar bowl. Yeah. That's why that's a fifty dollar bowl. Yeah. I mean, I think the ten to fifteen dollar range is just um, brilliant, just because um, I think most people have ten to fifteen dollars to spend on a bottle of wine. Oh, yeah. And if you compare, like, you don't get four liters like you would with a cask, but yeah, the. Yeah, I always go the, with one liter range. Yeah. I'm <laughs> All right, so that being said, that was our picks for our $15 and under. Uh, hope you've enjoyed it all. Um, if you we want to buy any of these wines, please feel free. We're, we're going to continue on. Are we going to do another um, uh, competition or? Yeah, okay. Well, actually, well, I suppose the first thing is. Um, Nobody won last week. So no, no, just well. Give the same prize away. Yeah. <laughs> if you know which wine won last week, won our pick last week, post it up. And we'll actually give you a, what was it that we gave last week? What was the last week? It was that Shiraz. Yeah. The yeah. winning Shiraz last week was, I'm not going to say, but we'll yeah, give a bottle, yeah. we'll sort of give a bottle of that to you, if yeah. you can figure out which one it was. Um, whoever posts first on the on the Facebook page will get that. Yeah. Um, but today I suppose we should really run through which wine out of these do you reckon you'd buy? Not a one. It's a little bit hard, that one. I think you'd have to judge it twice. Because you got reds and whites. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so, okay, well, what is the first link? <laughs> well, actually, you can't because in white yeah. shows, whites yeah. or reds can win. Can they? Okay. So, let's have a look. What? So, for the wine of show, or mm. to those, today's wine of show, um, which one did we think we would happily go back and have a second glass of? Uh, you know, I love my Yarram, yeah. but um, that is excellent. The yeah. Tempranillo is so good, easy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to go to Tempranillo as well. Yeah. It's brilliant. Oh, it's a, it's a hard choice for me between those two. But, yeah, I'll actually go to Tempranillo as well because I chose it. <laughs> but yeah. I think if it was summer, I would go with um, one of the Pinot Gris or the Rosés okay. just because it's yeah. lighter and it'd yeah. be really refreshing. I'd probably go for the Rosé because the and only re, the only reason I've... It's because it's Fosso. <laughs> yeah, Fosso does it help. <laughs> but uh, I will say that Yaren um, makes a great little wine, as, as I said. But... For me, Pinot Grigio, a little bit simpler. I like something with a bit more complexity, a little bit more interest for me. Oh, I'm a bit more simple. You're a simple boy. Yeah. I am simple. <laughs> uh, but that being said, though, that Tempranillo is fantastic. But that Shiraz is yeah. just like, oh. You know, so I was going to say, I think the winner for today is definitely the Alino Tempranillo. Definitely. definitely. Um, and, uh, yeah, we sell that here. We sell them all here. So please come in and buy some. Uh, thanks for watching. And next week, what are we going to do next week? What would you like to do next week? We're going to do it again? Yeah, we do it every Wednesday. Why not? We should do it Tuesday. It would save me a lot of drinking. <laughs> yeah, we did it Tuesday. We have Jason down the back there yeah. rambling. Yeah. So. Uh, I, did, I did like Darren's idea the other week about the ports. Like, I think coming into winter. Like, I, yeah, okay. I well, think, why think... not? Do you want to do fortifieds? Okay. It could get messy. We will yeah. do fortifieds, but we'll do fortified ports. Yeah, ports only because if we did sherries, then we'd be opening ourselves up to a plethora of, of yeah. drinks. So we are going to go through our port range. I've got a few new ports. So um, oh, can we include some? Um, uh, what's the other one? You just got in the new one. Uh, I'll just go look on the shelf. I forget what it is myself. What was it? Uh, it's not port. It's top shelf. Um, oh, that musket. Yeah, muskets. Can we add Ooh. some musket in? Oh, okay. Okay. That was easy. <laughs> We're going to do like the barrel port. Oh, like I, that, no, if you're going to do the barrel port, you'd have to do a blind tasting. Yeah. And that would that would be hard. That would be difficult. Blind tasting with, with uh, consumers who can't see it would be very yeah. difficult. Yes. <laughs> but um, we will throw, we'll actually do a tasting on the, the barrel port as well, but we'll do that at the end. It won't be part of the just regular tasting. That's, that's just free port. Yeah. That's just free port for us, yeah. <laughs> But um, I will say that, uh, yeah, we will do ports. We'll do four to five next week. And we'll do, a, I'll put together a range of ones. So we'll have a look at a musket. We'll have a look at a 15-year-old Australian. We may even have a look at a Portuguese port, what, what port should be. Um, as well, they're actually trying to take that away from us, aren't they? They're not supposed they've to taken it away. Port, we can't though. call it port. We can't call anything made in Australia Portello? port. No, we, what? that's port. That is port. Yeah. So what are we allowed to call it then? No, we call it uh, tawny. Uh, we call it either tawny or a pera. A pera okay, is actually just means fortified wine. So is port another name that's under? It is. It's, yeah. It's for Regional. for it to be called port, it has to be made in a port. Uh, it has to be. I'm trying to think of the actual word. It has to be matured in a porto in Portugal. 
Um, because so, uh, does that mean it doesn't have to be made there? It just has to be matured there? No, it can be made. We'll go through it then. Yeah, yeah why not? Right. Let's we'll look into it. Right. So, um, so drink well. Yeah. Drink like a say. Cheers. 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 All right. I think we can get on to real drinking now. <laughs> Still recording. That's right. <laughs>